Okay, so we're going to do a quick discussion on the transportation problem, the tableau, and what exactly the tableau is basically saying, or the table is saying. And so the first thing we're going to do here is we just have a table. It doesn't actually have any solution yet. I just want you to be able to understand what exactly everything in this table is saying to us. So remember, the transportation problem has a very specific setup, and that setup can be seen in this table. So when we're looking at everything, we can't actually, you know, figure out exactly what the problem is by just looking at this table. So the first thing that we do and uh, consider is the fact that the, this piece here is actually representing a decision variable. So it's representing decision variable, I'm just going to call it 1, 1, which is actually the decision variable from factory 1 to warehouse 1, or from the first destination to the first, from the first destination where we come from to the first destination that we can go to. And then this is x12, this is x13, this is x14, and this is x15. So it's the row and then the column number is essentially what's happening there. So that is, you know, row one, that is row two, that is column one, this is column two, this is column three, this is column four, and this is column five. And you can see the decision variable just telling you exactly where it's from and where it's to. And then you have x21, x22, x23, x24, x25. And you can actually tell what the constraints are and what the objective function is from this table. So what you can do is every single column is a demand constraint, which you can read as, you know, x11 plus x21. So you have x11 plus x21. And it's a demand, so you need at least 30 of these need to be, you know, produced or sent or transported or whatever. So you have greater than or equal to 30. Then you have the second column, which is x12 plus x22 is greater than or equal to 10. And you have x13 plus x23 is greater than or equal to 25. And then you have x14 plus x24 is greater than or equal to 20. And then you have x15 plus x25 is greater than or equal to 20. Then you have your row constraints, which are your supply constraints. So remember, these are all the demand constraints. And then you have all your supply constraints. So your supply constraints are, you just read it across here. So it is x11 plus x12 plus x13 plus x14 plus x15. And you only have 50 available. So your factory can only supply that many. So it is less than or equal to 50. And you do the same for the next one. So you have x21 plus x22 plus x23 plus x24 plus x25 is less than or equal to 55. Now, these are all your supply constraints. And you can actually write these a little bit differently. So you can, you know, go through the process of looking at them and saying, okay, fine. When we do this entire um, situation, we would, you know, in this case, the J is the one that's changing. So it's the summation where J is equal to one to, you know, however many you have. So this is five and you have X and you have I and you have J and then you'll have less than equal to, and then you'll have your supply constraint, which is usually like a be connected with your I value there. So what's actually happening is, you know, your, and then you have for I equals to one and two in this situation. And that's actually giving you, you know, all your supply constraints. This is not a big deal for you to, you know, understand and realize, but it's just so that you can see it and link it up. Your demand is also actually very similar, except here you're running through your eyes, so you're summing over your eyes, so one to two, then you'll have your xi and your j, and it will be greater than or equal to, you know, whatever constraint is related to your demand. I'm just going to refer to it as dj kind of situation, but j is your one, two, three, four, and five. So you can actually tell how many, you know, constraints that you kind of have happening. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You can count it from, you know, 
just the fact that you, you can count your columns and count your rows, and that's gonna tell you how many constraints that you have. So you have seven constraints, but what's gonna happen is when you have these seven constraints, one of those constraints can be made out of the others. So if you had to go ahead and you know, add up six of those constraints, you would pretty much be able to find the seventh one from them. So you're going to have a situation where you will have your N plus your M, in other words, number of your rows and columns, minus one of them are going to, you know, form your extreme point. So when we talk about, you know, the N plus the M minus the one of the non-empty cells, it is because what's going to happen is you are going to have, in this case, six constraints which are binding. And when we talk about binding constraints, we mean those are the ones that are making up the corner points. So a good idea to be able to you know, figure out what we talk about when we say it's binding is when we have, let's say we have this constraint here and we have that constraint there kind of situation. And now we say everything underneath this one is feasible. Everything underneath this one is feasible. And everything on this side of this one is feasible. What's happening there is that this constraint over here is not binding. And so when we're making up that corner point, that constraint actually you know, isn't making an impact on that corner point. And that means that when we go through, you know, the whole process of this and we work out the corner point there, we have the X and the Y is the only thing that really matters. So we have those two decision variables are the ones that are, you know, making a difference in that case. And obviously when you increase it from, you know, just X, Y, Z kind of variables um, or, you know, nth number of them, what's going to end up happening is it's going to have an impact on how you represent your extreme point. But the only thing you need to be um, think about and consider here is that when we talk about, you know, we have six of these ones are going to be binding because we have the case of one of them is going to be dependent on the others. So one of these constraints, and you can do it, you can play around with it and investigate it. It means that when we are investigating this later on, we're actually investigating where they are actual lines so we're not looking at the inequalities when we're working out this extreme point right we're working out where those lines are equal to each other in other words where there are no longer inequalities but there are equalities so that's going to make a huge impact when we go and investigate a little bit later in our modi method and everything from there what you do need to understand about this is you need to recognize that all of these are actual constraints going in that direction, constraints going in that direction. We also have the objective function represented in this table. So we have the objective function represented in this table in the center part. And what you do is it's basically the cost coefficient multiplied by the decision variable. So you would have in this case, 24 times x11, 24 times x12 plus 5 times x13 plus 20 times x14 plus 20 times x15 plus 30 times x21 plus 24 times x22 plus 20 times x23 plus 2 times x24 plus 18 times x25 that is your objective function that's your cost equation so you can see the entire problem on this table and when you're going to go do the northwest corner method when you're going to do modi's method you do need to understand that those are constraints and that's actually what it's representing you don't have to overly stress about this but the fact that you know you need n plus n minus one of them are going to be linearly independent is connected to how many non-empty cells you need for the binding situation. So and again, you don't have to stress overly about the binding situation. You just have to think about it as, in that case, the inequalities are actually equalities and just go with that. But 
You just need to know n plus n minus one non-empty souls. It's connected to the linear ind independent constraints and the linear independent constraints are the ones that are creating, you know, the corner point. So it's just kind of like one of these equations will be represented by a combination of the rest of them. And that's where we get that n plus n minus one non-empty souls from, because if that's the situation, if we have one of these equations is represented by one of the others, then we don't have to overly stress because, you know, about all of those cells. The rest of them are just going to be equal to zero, basically. Right.